I've, I've really enjoyed the, the meeting so far. And in fact, it's, it's good that I was listening because I was confused about the time. So, but thankfully I, I am prepared. Let's see, okay. Uh, so you see my screen there. Okay. Yeah, so I, I'm gonna say a few things very briefly. Uh, if people want more details, I have posted these slides and many more at this link, jljcolorado.substack.com. And there is also a recording there from a recent talk about air cleaners, and you can have, find a lot more information there. Um, so, yeah. okay. so what's urban transmission? I think mo most people know, but let's review it. This person is infected, so the virus is on their saliva and respiratory fluid, and somehow that virus needs to enter the physical world and get to the mucoses or the eyes of this susceptible person. That can happen through a surface when they both touch the same surface and, and then this person touches their eyes, something like that. At the beginning, they told us this was dominant. Now we know it's negligible. Uh, then the, the one that was really the favorite of WHO were these droplets or drops. And these are projectiles. These are balls of saliva that they can be seen with the right light and they travel through the air very quickly and they hit this person inside the eyes, inside the nostrils or inside the mouth. And this is what they told us was dominant. And then together with those large projectiles, there are many more of these smaller ones that float in the air like a smoke. They have too little inertia to, to stay, to, to be a projectile. So they float in the air and they infect when we inhale them. This is airborne transmission. Now, at the beginning of the pandemic, and you can still see this video uh, from WHO, and there are many public health organizations that keep saying that this is a dominant form of transmission. Um, so, but they had this video in which the projectiles left this person, they impacted this person, and um, that's how infection happened. And partially they were trying to explain an empirical observation for COVID and, or the other diseases that if you increase the distance, you reduce transmission. And their interpretation is that happens because later in the video, the droplets, the projectiles leave this person, they follow a parabolic trajectory and they land here. And this person is saved by gravity. Right, so distance works, but distance works because of gravity. Now, this is the key scientifically of the whole thing. Uh, this is a bunch of doctors and public health people who don't study physics, making a mistake on physics 100 years ago and repeating it for 100 years. Because the reason why distance, which is known for centuries, works to reduce airborne transmission is not gravity, it's dilution. Basically, this person is exhaling an invisible smoke, in this situation, this person is gonna inhale a lot more, in this case, a lot less, right? So now some other nonsensical thing that WHO was saying is like when there is transmission, and when I say WHO, I mean lots of public health organizations, when, when, it's, when it happens in close proximity, those are the droplets that we know because it's in close proximity and that's a synonym of droplets. Now there can be airborne transmission, but that's only when you are far, when you are sharing a room. This makes no sense, you know, how are these aerosols gonna get there? The real picture is this one. The aerosols are most concentrated in the exhalation of the infected person. And we have two types of airborne transmission, transmission in close proximity, sometimes people call it short range, and transmission in a shared room. Now, um, we wrote uh, a paper, this was in 2021, led by Trish Greenhall and with a bunch of other colleagues summarizing all the evidence you know, from super spreading events and lots of other evidence that was already very clear <clears throat> about airborne transmission. And already then we said, you know, maybe there are other routes, but we think airborne is dominant. And I think since then it's much clearer that airborne is the only important form of transmission of COVID. Now, you know, we, we encountered a, a lot of resistance as, as many of you know. So why did we encounter so much resistance? I think, I mean, I think as many people know, a lot of has to do with politics and economics and whatever, but there was a, a historical reason that we explored on, on this paper and that I briefly described with this diagram. This is the, the thinking as a function of history of how many of these epidemic diseases when a lot of people get you know, tuberculosis or cholera or, or malaria, how many of those are going through the air. And historically, since Hippocrates, since the Greeks, it was thought that most of them were going through the air. This was the miasma theory and its variants. And, and really that was the dominant theory until 1850 when John Snow shows no cholera is really the water. And Ignaz Semmelweis shows that puerperal fever is really through the hands. And malaria, malaria was thought to be bad air, uh, is shown to go through mosquitoes. So then there is a period of debate around 1900, you know, are there diseases that really go through the air? 
And then um, Charles Chapin is an American epidemiologist, and he says this airborne thing, this was a superstition. This really is not true. And, and you know, extraordinary claims need extraordinary evidence. And really, there is nothing that goes to the air. And the CDC is founded on this premise. The founder of the CDC, I mean, we explained in the article, basically said Chapin is the best. And, and they really thought that no, no important disease was airborne. So I think that the period since then we qualified as resistance to airborne, you know? So it's only admitted if you really cannot deny it. And that's what happened with tuberculosis and later with measles and chickenpox, it just became so clear that it couldn't be denied. And that's what's happening with COVID-19, but, but we face again, an extraordinary resistance. When you will not find papers like the one I showed you before saying, this is the, evidence in favor of droplets or in favor of surfaces, because there isn't any. Large droplet transmission has never been <laughs> demonstrated for any disease, not just for COVID, for any disease. Yet WHO told us immediately that, that they knew it. Okay, okay so I'm gonna say uh, one more thing very quickly, uh, which was about air cleaners. And we've been studying recently the health impacts of air cleaners. And, and there are many types of air cleaners that as, as people were discussing, you know, we. Sometimes we don't know, as, as consumers, what do they do? They all seem to disinfect the air. However, only some of them also reduce air pollution. So these remove viruses, but what about removing particles that are also very a big killer, as, as was discussed earlier, only a few types. And many types actually increase pollution. And in increasing pollution, they can kill people. So what we've been exploring recently is, well, if we are in a situation like December uh, 2022, where there was a lot of COVID, do they help more than they hurt? And so we're gonna show it in, in this diagram. So this is whether they help or they hurt. So the ones that are to the right of zero, they save more people than they kill. And the ones to the left, they actually kill more people through the pollution than they save from the disinfection. And this is the, the cost, okay? So I, I don't have time, there is more details in the presentation to explain how we got to this. So what we recommend is always filters and activated carbon. Those always have a very positive impact. They're not very expensive. We think these ones are the ugly ionizers or hydroxyl or ozone generators or photocatalytic oxidation. My take is those should be avoided. Now we have these ionizers or bipolar ionizers. They are very expensive and it's not clear that they, that they work. And then we have finally uh, germicidal ultraviolet and electrostatic precipitators, which they do generate pollution and that pollution is gonna kill some people. Right, so, so that gives us pause. We shouldn't put UV everywhere, for example, but we can put it in some places when, when it has an overwhelming benefit. Okay, so I'll leave it there, thanks. And sorry if I went over.